So my game for the, today, it has a couple of different names. It can be called the Q game, or I think you had another name for it too. Something Q something. Play Q play. Yeah, that's your version of it. So for me, I just simply call it an on off switch. But basically, that's what it is. Um, you can take your dog's favorite game, whatever that may be. So when I first taught Azul how to play this, it was a simple tug rope game. And so we would be playing. And the first thing I taught him was, if I drop the toy, you turn off. So when you're playing with a young puppy and a tug toy, what happens commonly when you drop the toy? They come after your hands. So that's kind of where I start with that. I don't want him coming after my hand. So if I drop the toy, he has to just stop and wait. And as long as he stops and waits, I'm going to grab that toy and start playing again. Or I'm going to produce a second toy to start playing again. And that's kind of the beginning of it. But then as you progress, you can add more difficult criteria to where like you're throwing in a cue. So... We might be playing tug and then all of a sudden I can say stop, which he knows now is his stop cue. And so, or drop is a common one in this particular case too. And he'll stop and wait for the next cue. And typically then I'll like tell him to sit or something so that I can back away from him a few steps and hold the toy up in the air to make it exciting. And then I'll say, okay, now get it. And we go right back to play it and we'll repeat that a few times. And we'll usually do that for a few different training sessions. But once you do that, you can add in another cue. And the more you do it, the more cues you can add. So you're teaching your dog to go from that excited state back into that more neutral state simply on cue, which is a good brain game for the dog. And it kind of helps them learn how to self-regulate. So I was given the example at the dog park as well knows he's not getting out the door until he calms down. It's because we've been, played so many different cue games where when he has gotten excited, he's been given a cue that doesn't, that can't be done in that excited state, such as sit. I often, I don't use sit very often when I'm doing things because I don't want Azul to make his, you know, wear his hips out all too early being a service dog. But I'll use things like that. Just like if you don't want them to jump, you ask them to stand between your legs or Azul knows the cue wait means stand wherever he's at and not move and things like that. So either, when you play the cue game, you get them a little bit excited. So you don't want to get them overexcited, just mildly excited so that they can still listen and you can help bring them back down. And the more you play, the higher excitement level you can raise in the game, and they can still learn to come back down to a neutral state. And you can play it with multiple different types of toys. Nick right. has three sets of toys he plays with. He's got um, a chaser that he plays with. He's got a um, flirt pole that he plays with. And he's got a squirrel that he plays with. And we play with those slightly different, but he has the same, he has multiple cues. The other thing is when you're to the point of proofing a cue and you wanna make sure that cue is solid before you take it someplace, this is a good way to really drive home that cue because right. they really, because you're really giving them, it's like, okay, you have to eat your peas and then you can go swimming. And, then you can have your ice cream and go swimming. So um, you're going to eat your peas because you're going to, you want your ice cream and to go swimming. So right. this is similar. It's a pre-mac type thing. Right. If you want to have your cake and eat it too, you mm -hmm. got to think about it first. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not to think about what you're doing. So yes, that is the on off switch. I'll have simple instructions for if you're just starting out. I'm working on that with puppy right now because when she sees a person and I'm glad that this has been her conditioned response to people so far, but when she sees a person, she instantly goes into, oh, they're going to pet me. 
So she instantly is, you know, zero to 100 in a second, wanting to rush up to them and get her pets. And as soon as they start touching her, she melts and calms down. But I don't want her running toward every single person. So we're working on in our toy play when we have no other people around this on off switch so that when she sees the person, she can look at me first and I can tell her we're either going to leave it or we're going to heal or we're going to stay. Those are all kinds of the things we're working on. And then as that person approaches and they stop, then I can give her permission to go greet. And then, you know, if she rushes to get to them extra fast at that point, I don't mind. But I don't want her rushing to get to them without that kind of permission because she is a service dog in training, not for myself. She's not my puppy. I just have her for 12 days, kind of working on some basics. But we want her to start to develop that on-off switch because it's something that she doesn't have at five months old. And it also teaches, dis uh, it teaches arousal up, arousal down, and it teaches disengagement because they have to disengage from the toy to um, do the cue, whether it's the drop toy or disengaging from you. So it's a really handy, it, it hits on multiple levels on shaping things we want in the brain. And it, it's one of my favorite games to play with the with the pups. Right. We can't expect that dog to disengage from a squirrel or a bird or another dog. And if we can't get them to disengage from a toy in mm -hmm. our house. So that bird, squirrel, dog, whatever it may be outside is going to be far more exciting than any toy you have in your house. So we have to teach them how to do that disengage, how to turn off and come back to us when that excitement happens, if we don't teach it at home, they won't get it. So that's what the game is designed to do. Yeah. And it's a, it's, it's just, I can't say enough good stuff about it. It's helped Nick so much. Right. We've played it a lot at his little stage too. So, and all the way through the teenage stage, it's a great game. Yeah. You might have to amp up the games you're playing and the toys you're using in order to get the same response when you start working around more exciting distractions, such as we take the flirt pole to the dog park, not to the dog park, but outside of the dog park. And we typically start at about 200 feet away. And Azul will be on a long line that's attached to me so he can't get to the dog park. But anytime he disengages from me playing with the flirt pole to go check out the dog park, I know he's too close and too excited and we'll back off for a little bit and play where we're at and then slowly make our way closer again. So with practice, we, you know, we were down to about 30 feet away from the dog park last year, but winter has hit and it's not happening because snow is too deep. So that's something we will have to restart again, probably at the same 200 feet, if not further, when we have nice enough weather to do so. So just because he has that great on-off switch, it doesn't mean he's going to be able to do it around his most exciting distractions without practice. And, you know, it takes a while to build up these games and these skills and to shape their brains so that they understand, so that they learn to make the good, the better choices. Right. And that's okay. Um, you know, it just, we've got to give them confidence and the more games we play the more confidence we give right. them so be sure to check out the videos that are going to be attached with this day to show you exactly how to play this game and then keep in mind you want to slowly add in distractions when you're playing games you're going to see progress in just two to three weeks for milder distractions but you might have to play for six months eight months 12 months before you're actually going to see a change around their largest distractions. So you got to kind of remember what it is and how exciting it is to them. And you have to match that. So, but everybody has to start small and you have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. So work the dog in front of you at their pace and at with distractions that they're comfortable playing the games at. And don't worry about your dog not being perfect 
No, no dog is perfect. They all go through a adolescence and young adult. They all struggle with it. Just it, some are just better at getting through it than others. And what it boils down to is how well they do is a lot of it is how much time and energy their handler is willing to put into training them. Even adult dogs are going to face distractions that you didn't anticipate or didn't mm -hmm. predict that you didn't train around that could still easily send them over threshold or in that red line state. So right. it's not an end all be all. They're going to be fine around all distractions always. No, it's giving them the skills to handle the distractions as best as possible, given the surroundings and the environment they're in. Yeah, I mean, I had my rock solid Great Pyrenees get a little agitated because she had a tiger coming at her. I don't blame her. Uh, I, yeah, was, I was like, I want out of here too. <laughs> and, um, you know, you don't necessarily know what, how your dog is going to react in a situation like that. Well, her job was to protect me. So she felt her job was to get me out of there. So she did. But then she sat and uh, we were watching do a dolphin show. And then she sat and she stared at the gate where the tigers were and made sure that, and the lot and the, um, made sure I was okay and safe. But you can't necessarily, I mean, there I could have anticipated the tiger, but you can't necessarily anticipate things. I was walking down the street and ran into a guy with a boa constrictor, you know, <laughs> so you never know what's going to happen. Right. And so um, we hope you're enjoying the workshop so far. This day was a little bit longer, but it was really important to get all the information out there about emotions, because until you understand the emotions your dog is experiencing, you can't really train around distractions. You have to be able to read your dog and you have to know what they're feeling. You have to kind of put yourself in their shoes. Um, so even if something is not a scary thing, if your dog is afraid of it, you have to accept that as their truth and you can work on it, but you don't want to flood them with it. Nobody wants to be dropped in the lion's den or put in a hole full of snakes or covered by a million spiders. Nobody wants that. And we should not expect our dogs to be okay with that either. So we want to protect their optimism, but we right. also want to prepare them for what they have to, to deal with in life. Right. So there's a whole lot more information on this available that we will have out there for you, you know, either on the Uper Paws blog, um, just kind of a sneak we're going to have at the end of the week. Uh, if your dog is an adolescent, we're releasing a new classroom that has a whole lot more about focus around distractions than what we're doing in this mini workshop. So we do have a lot of resources already developed to help you with this. We know we're kind of just touching the tip of the iceberg on a lot of these things. So if you want more information, our contact information is up on the screen. You can contact myself or Cindy. We like helping people through this. So if you need help, let us know. Yes, we both had challenging dogs. So we've had some experience personally with challenging dogs and we're more than willing to help you right so uh, we're going to cut it short there we know this video is long we hope you come back for day three we have more exciting fun for you on day three it's only going to get better as the week goes on